are going to work on finishing out the book of Romans over the next couple of months. And by the end of the summer, um, by the end of July, hopefully we will be done with Romans. But I'm excited to be back here today and in a new sermon series, A Taste of Heaven on Earth. Principles that make this possible. Now, doesn't that sound fantastic? A Taste of Heaven on Earth. Doesn't that sound really good to you right now this morning? Man, when you think of that phrase, what comes to your mind? Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of time to think about that. I've had a long time to think about different things on this, but would any of you respond with one of the first things that come to your mind when you think of a taste of heaven on earth? How many of you think of food? Anybody here think of food? That was one of the first things that came to your mind. This past Monday night, man, we had Alana's aunts were in town and some of her cousins and her dad, we had them all over for dinner. We smoked some ribs. We ate some really amazing food, and then we end it with a piece of pound cake, homemade pound cake with fresh fruit, vanilla ice cream. And at the end of all of that, with a cup of coffee, it was just like one of those moments, just a taste of heaven on earth. Y'all know what I'm talking about right there. How many of you are like, you're hungry already and ready to get to some lunch today? All right. So uh, who who thinks of family? Anybody did family come to your mind when you think of a taste of heaven on earth? Uh, We were on vacation. We were in Key Largo. One of the days we drove down to Key Largo to check out the Florida Keys and we went snorkeling. It was the first time I had ever done that with my family and with our kids. And um, first time I'd ever done that, just period. And as we're going out, the captain of the boat said, hey, these are days that we dream about when we go to sleep at night. The seas were perfectly calm. It was clear and we're snorkeling and just enjoying God's creation. And one time I looked up through my goggles and I saw my wife and all my kids. And it was just one of those moments that just hit you. Like it all, I almost started crying in my goggles right there. Just God is just good. You know what I'm talking about? You ever have those moments with your family or how many of you is it a quiet morning? Man, just as much fun as we had on vacation, I was very, when we pulled back into our driveway, I was excited to be back home. I love my home. I love my house. I love the memories that we make on a daily basis. I love my job. I love my church. I love what I get to do. I was glad to be home. And one of my favorite things to do is sit outside in my backyard in the morning with a cup of coffee. So I unpacked and I rushed outside before it got dark. I mowed my whole lawn so that the next morning when I got up, everything would be perfect. And guess what? It was. I went outside. I had my coffee. I opened up my Bible. I sat with God. A taste of heaven and earth. How many of you can, can relate to moments like that? Maybe, maybe for you it's a day playing golf or maybe it's reading a book in peace and quiet or a walk on the beach or a hike through the mountains. The point is this. We serve a good, good father, right? And he saved us and he wants us to enjoy the things of this life and the things of this world. And even though we live in a broken, sin-cursed, messed up world, there are still moments along the way where we can taste and we can begin to experience a little bit of heaven on earth. Well, I wonder if any of you, when you thought of a taste of heaven on earth, I wonder if anybody here, your mind went to a unified church. Did anybody think of that at the top of your list? A unified church. Guess what the Bible says in Psalms? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And can I tell you, the day that you got saved, you became a member of God's family. And outside of your relationship with God and your family, you know what should be one of your top priorities? Church. And I'm not talking about just attending church. I'm talking about we are the body and bride of Jesus Christ. And we are left in this world to do life together. And if we're going to do life together, and if we're going to spend a lot of time with one another, how good and how pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. Now, I cannot minimize how important a topic like this is in scripture, not just because as a pastor, I want it to be important and it's my heart that our church is unified, but because it's the heart of God himself. It's the heart of Jesus Christ. Mike, go ahead and put John 17 up on the screen. I want to read to you just two verses and really this whole section is packed full of this, but this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane praying Literally hours, maybe moments before he's going to be betrayed by Jesus. Less than 24 hours before he's going to be hanging on a cross, dying for our sins. And this is what he's praying in the garden. Look what he says. He's praying to his father and he says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. Now leave it there before we go to the next verse. Do you understand what Jesus, he's praying 
that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one. Do you understand that Jesus and God the Father were 100% unified? They understood that before the foundation of this world, God knew that we would sin. God knew that we would be in need of a savior and his plan for redemption was that he would send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of this world so that we could have a relationship with him. They were 100% unified and committed to that and he's praying that we as his people would experience that same sense of unity because can I tell you folks, this world is in desperate need of a savior. How many of you have neighbors and coworkers and family members that are lost And they need Jesus Christ. And the only thing that can heal and the only thing that can save and the only hope that we have is him. God wants us to experience that same sense of unity. Jesus is praying for this. And then look what he says in verse 23. He goes on to say this, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And why is this so important? And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Unity is important. Unity is the heart of God because the way that we love one another and the way that we do life together and the way that we can think alike and the way that that we are focused on the mission of why God's put us here in this earth is the way that God's glory is seen in this world. We are the visible representation of the presence of Jesus and through us, we get to point people to the fact that they can have a relationship with God, which is the greatest need that all of us have in all of the world. When Ben was up here just a little bit ago, and by the way, it's great to have Pastor Ben here with us for a couple weeks, and man, it was awesome just hearing his voice. I miss that voice, Ben, on a regular basis. Not that Nathaniel and Dan can't sing. They are great too, okay? But I miss having that. But man, when he was up here reading from Revelation, and he's passionately talking about what it's going to, do you realize that one day, One day we're going to be in the presence of Jesus with every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation, with every type of people that thinks differently than us, that looks differently than us, and we're going to be united around the throne of God, praising and singing glory to God the Father. You know what he wants? He wants us to begin to experience and taste that even now, today. And that leads me to the title of our message this morning, which is Unite It, Not Divide It. Unite it, not divide it. Romans 14 and part of 15. You know what it's all about? It's all about the heart attitude that we should have towards other believers. Okay, so this is, this is about you and me individually, all right? This is about my heart attitude, how I should view and how I should approach my relationships with all of you here. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand that I just said it's just, just about me. Don't sit there and think it's just about me. No, it's about you. This is something that we should take personally as we go through this. And when our hearts are geared, when our hearts are geared towards looking for what unites us, what brings us together, what we have in common, when we are looking for that and when we are finding those things, not what divides us, we can begin to experience and taste a little bit of heaven on earth. And so let's just dive right into it. The first point that I have this morning is this, believe it's possible. Believe it's possible. Sometimes when I think about unity, I feel like, oh, I don't think it's ever going to happen. But we got to believe it's possible. Hey, the reason why Romans 14 is written, the reason why we have these principles here is if we follow them and if we line our lives up to them, we can experience that as a church. God wants us to experience that as a church. And so this whole point is just a little bit about the background. Like, how did we get to chapter 14? And why is Paul even writing this and addressing this very important topic? Well, I got a couple things I just want to say. And this is actually still by way of introduction, but let's just dive right into it so you get the whole context. Here's the first thing under believe it's possible. Churches aren't perfect. How many of you are surprised by that this morning? Anybody shocked out of your mind? Churches aren't perfect. Inside the church of Rome, there was disunity. In a minute, we're going to see that there were weak and strong Christians. They did not see eye to eye on things. I'll save that for a little bit. But guess what? All through the Bible, there is disunity. The Old Testament is full of civil wars and family fights inside the nation of Israel. I mean, you'll find disunity all through the Old Testament. Then when you get to the New Testament, almost every single New Testament church had problems. For instance, in 1 Corinthians, 
They fought about a whole lot of things. I mean, these people were messed up. They sued each other. They didn't deal with sin. I mean, I could go down a list of things. One of the things they fought about was who their leader was. And there was factions and divisions in the church over Peter, Paul, and Apollos. Now, if you know anything about Peter, Paul, and Apollos, these are about as good of Christian leaders and examples as you're ever going to find. And yet the church is dividing into factions. Well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Peter and I'm of Apollos. How many of you agree? That's, that's really silly and really ridiculous when you stop and think about it. I mean, that's the church of Corinth. The Galatians, they were described as biting and devouring each other. The critical spirit that they had towards one another, Paul saying, if you all don't get this under control, you're going to be consumed of one another. And you're not going to have a church anymore if you can't figure out how to set aside these differences and stop biting and devouring one another. Church at Philippi, they had an interesting one. They had two women in a knockdown drag out fight and it was split in the church down the middle. Now, how many of you agree that when two women are in a knockdown drag out fight, you run and hide as far as you can get from that? I mean, that's going on in the church of Philippi. In, in um, Ephesus and Colossae, they, were, they had to be reminded to be united, not divided. All I'm trying to say is churches aren't perfect. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad to have you. And I want you to know our church is far from perfect. How many of you like that for a welcome line and a welcome speech? Man, aren't you glad you showed up today? But listen, honestly, I, I believe that's one of the most refreshing things that we have to remind ourselves of on a regular basis. There's no perfect church. We live in a sinful world, and I'm not, we shouldn't pretend to try to be something that we're not, but we ought to be absolutely working and lining our lives up with the principles from God's word so we can become more and more like Christ. All right, so I think we all are on the same page there. We understand churches aren't perfect, but guess what? People aren't perfect. Churches aren't perfect because people aren't perfect, and I'm not here today to run down people. I'm a person. And I'm not perfect. And you know what? I want you to have grace and mercy towards me. I love people. God wants us to love people. But people aren't perfect, even people with good intentions. Now, this is where we're getting into Romans chapter 14. You have to understand this. We're going to be talking about people with good intentions in in Romans chapter 14. And I want you to look back at, at the end of Romans chapter 13 with me. Look at verse 11, and I believe we have that that will come up on the screen too. Just to bring you the context of where we're at, look at what it says in verse 11. And that knowing the time. That thou that now it is high time. Everybody read those next four words with me. To do what? To awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Guess what? Christ is coming back. And we are closer today to the return of Christ than we were yesterday. You're closer to standing in the presence of Jesus today than you were yesterday. And you know what the Bible says? Wake up. It's time to get busy. We got a mission. The world needs to know that there's a God and a Savior that loves them. Wake up. Stop living a frivolous life for the things of this world. And then he goes on in verse 12 and he says, cast off the works of darkness. And then look what he says in verse 14. Everybody read this out loud with me, okay? You all help me out in verse 14. He says this, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So Romans chapter 13 ends with a call to wake up, get busy doing what God wants you to do, cast off the works of darkness, the things that you did before you were saved, the things that you do for your flesh and for yourself, cast off. And put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh. And all of a sudden now we're going to transition into Romans 14. And guess what topic Paul's going to start talking about? Personal convictions. That's exactly where he's going. Our personal convictions. You want another thing that I'm sure is going to shock every single person in here this morning. Guess what? Are you ready for this? Not everybody sees eye to eye on the things that we should put off and the things that we should put on. Not everybody sees eye to eye on what brings glory to God and what doesn't bring glory to God. We have different opinions and we come to different conclusions on this. The the specific problems between the weak and the strong in the church at Rome, guess what they centered around? They centered around meat, they centered around days, and at the end of the chapter, they centered around wine. All right, so just to give you a little context of where we're going now in Romans chapter 14. The weak Christians... They would not eat meat. Now, you might be saying, oh, that just sounds like a sin in and of itself to not eat meat. They would not eat meat, and there was a good reason for it. 
Back then, if you were to go buy meat, you'd have to go to the marketplace, and almost every piece of meat that was sold was offered as a sacrifice to the idols. And they didn't want to be associated with anything that was evil, and so they would not eat meat because it had been involved in idolatry. And so their consciences were seared, and they wouldn't do it. The strong, on the other hand, they realized that meat is meat. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles the heart of man. It's what comes out of your heart that defiles a man. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he's given us all things to enjoy. And this steak that is cooked perfectly, medium, and it's hot and it's juicy. Oh, it is so good and delicious to the glory of God, okay? So th- these are the kind of things that these debates centered around. Another, another issue was the, the week made a big deal about the days, all right, for instance, like most likely these were Jewish Christians that were new believers and they wanted to keep the feast and the festivals of the Old Testament and maybe they wanted to keep in honor a lot of the Sabbath day traditions. Well, the Gentile Christians who are just getting saved, they got no clue about any of this stuff. It doesn't matter to them. And so, you know what the strong Christians realized? The strong Christians recognize that every single day should be a day that's devoted to the Lord. How many of you agree with that? And whether you keep a day or don't keep a day, it does not change the fact that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. And every single day of our lives should be a day that is devoted to bringing honor and glory to God and lifting high the name of Jesus. And it doesn't necessarily matter if you follow the day or you don't follow the day. Those are just two of the examples that we're going to be looking at here in the first six verses. Well, guess what? Here's the practical application of that. Those same two categories, the weak and the strong, they exist in every single church in America today. I can promise you, every church that's gathering, they have people that are coming to different conclusions about personal convictions. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, I've never heard a debate about meat or not meat and days or not days, okay? Yes, the issues may look a little bit different. Maybe the issues might have to do with personal dress standards or the style of worship or what kind of music you listen to or what kind of TV you watch or what kind of movies you go to or whether we should have an Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday or whether we should have a Christmas Eve service or a Good Friday service. I mean, people just have opinions about everything, don't they? And how many of you would say, I got an opinion about everything? I mean, the Bible does tell us too to let every man be fully persuaded. I was thinking about a couple things today that just personal examples. One was when my mom and dad, when they first got saved, they got led to the Lord by Mennonites. And so when they first got saved, you know what? My mom started wearing a head covering. There's pictures of my brother Dave and I when we were like toddlers, when we were young and just black pants and a white shirt. And you know what my dad did? My dad went out and spray painted his car black so that it wouldn't be flashy or worldly. Now, have any of you ever came across any verses in your Bible reading that tell you you should spray paint your car black so we're not in the world, like, you know, we're not worldly people? No, you're not going to find that. And thankfully, my mom and dad grew in their walk with the Lord, and that didn't last very long. But I will say this, there's a lot of Mennonite people that genuinely love the Lord with their whole heart and soul. I remember more in the recent um, past Although it's getting further and further away. Back when we were youth pastors, I remember going to a youth conference one time and the, uh, one of the preachers got up there and started preaching against MySpace. Does anybody even remember MySpace? <laughs> I had never even heard of it, but he's like going off about MySpace. I'm like, what's MySpace? You shouldn't have MySpace. And then the next year we went back and Facebook had come on the scene. And I remember one preacher, he made a comment. He's like, you ought to delete your Facebook and you ought to get your face in the book. Now I was like, okay, that's pretty catchy right there. And I'll tell you this morning, I'll tell you this. That's actually really not that bad of advice. We should spend a whole lot less time on Facebook, and we should spend a whole lot more time with our face in the book. Can I get an amen from God's people on that? I think there's some good advice on that. But how many of you have ever run into people that have really strong opinions about social media and whether you should have it or not and what you should post on it or not? You all understand, all I'm trying to say is that there's all kinds of issues that come down to personal convictions and whether or not we're, we're being holy or unholy that exist inside the church today. And the last thing I'm going to say by way of under this first point about believing it's possible, because you might be wondering, well, how do we believe it's possible if churches aren't perfect and if people aren't perfect? God's truth is perfect. God's truth is perfect. Look at verse 17, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but this is what inspired this whole series. Go ahead and put it up there on the screen if you got it, Mike, in the back. Look what it says. It says, 
For the kingdom of God is not what? Meat and drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, when we get to heaven, when we're standing around the throne of God, we're not going to debate anymore about what we should eat and not eat and what we should watch and not watch and, and, and all these different things that we're talking about. That's not going to be a part of heaven. You know what heaven's going to be? Righteousness and peace and joy. And I long for that day and I anticipate that day. I want that day more and more in my life. But you know what God wants us to experience? He wants us to begin to experiencing that now. The kingdom of God, our relationships with each other, should not major on things that are minor. It should not major on the things that we don't always see eye to eye on, the things that aren't spelled out in black and white in God's word, but they ought to major on righteousness and peace with one another and joy in the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you, if every single one of us get up every single day and do what we're told in the Beatitudes, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You get up every day and you long and you thirst to do right and to please God with your life, I promise you, there's gonna be far more that unites us than what divides us. And I promise you, the more that we're focused on those things, oh, the more our relationships and the unity inside of this church is gonna be a wonderful breath of fresh air that we need every single week of our life and every time we gather together and every time we run into somebody. And that's what God desires for his church. And that's why Romans chapter 14 and 15 are here in God's word. So here's some practical applications. Point number two, so believe it's possible. Y'all believe it's possible? Y'all want to have a unified church? Okay, here's some practical applications. Here's some teaching for this to happen. Welcome all believers. Welcome all believers. Look at verse 14. I mean, chapter 14, verse 1. It says this, Him that is weak in the faith... Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Let's just break this down for a second. Let's talk about the person that is weak in the faith. You know, a weak believer is one whose convictions are stronger than what is necessary. Now, I just want to, again, clarify something. We are not talking about doctrinal issues or the fundamentals of the faith. If you ever run into somebody and they say that Jesus is just a good man and a good teacher, but I'm not sure if he's the son of God, that's something that you divide over right there. There's only one way to heaven and it's through Jesus Christ and he is God and he was born of a virgin and he died on the cross and he rose again and there is no other way to salvation but through him. Those are things that we make a big deal about. Those are things we stand on. Those are things that we divide over. Those are things that we separate about. We're also not talking about black and white sin issues. Just because you're saved and God's grace and mercy is limitless doesn't give you the right to go out and commit adultery or doesn't give you the right to go steal something from somebody else. Those are things that are black and white in God's word. 100% they're wrong, okay? So we're not talking about this. We're talking about the areas that are not clearly defined in God's word. And a weak believer is someone whose convictions are stronger than what is necessary. Eating meat was not wrong. That's what Paul's teaching throughout this. It, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Meat is just meat. And whether you observe the days or don't deserve the days, that's not necessarily right or wrong. So there, there's a weak believer, again, is one whose convictions are stronger than what is necessary. Liberty in Christ, let me just say this, liberty in Christ is a black and white issue in the Bible. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand ye fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again to the yoke of bondage. When Christ died on the cross, he set us free from the law, and we are free to walk in our relationship with him. And it's not based on a list of do's and don'ts. It's based completely on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. So we have liberty in Christ, and we need to stand fast in that liberty. Don't worry when we get to, I know there's more context even in Galatians, because he says, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. And he's going to talk to the strong specifically more as we go through Romans chapter 14, how we should deal with the weak. But today, this is all about our heart attitude towards one another. So look what he says, him that is weak in the faith. What's those next two words in verse 1? Receive ye. Receive implies the warmth and kindness of genuine love. Okay, so when you come to church, we have greeters. We have people all over the place that from the time you step foot on our property, people are waving, people are saying hi. Hey, we're glad to see you. We're glad to have you today. You may even shake your hands with somebody on your way out. That's not what we're talking about here. 
That's just friendliness. You know what that word receive means? That word receive, it implies the warmth and kindness of genuine love. In other words, with one another, we have to go beyond just the surface levels. Hi, how are you doing? And we got to receive you into our hearts and into our lives because guess what? You're not just a person. You're a believer. You're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. We are family. And we did all that fun stuff. Remember when we got up and stood and sung, we are family? No, we're not going to do that today, but we went through all of that already. Do you understand what I'm talking about? We've got to receive, we got to go past that surface level stuff. And he's saying, even, even the weak, even the people that, that may not be fully where they're supposed to be, receive. And why do, and, and then, oh, I love what he says at the end. I cannot skip ahead. And then he ends the verse with this. This is so good. Him that is weak in the faith receive you. Everybody help me out. What's it say at the end? But not to, not to doubtful disputations. We welcome other people into our lives without passing judgment on them over what? Doubtful disputations or disputable matters. Have you ever recognized that most of what Christians argue about we go round and around in circles and we pull out a verse that is in support of it and we pull out another verse that's not in support of it and we just go back and forth, round and round. And the reason why we argue and the reason why we debate endlessly about these things is because there's no concrete, clear, definitive answer in God's word. That's why we do that. And you know what he's saying? The church should not be a place where we argue and talk and go over disputable matters over and over and over again. No, the church should be a place where we're setting that stuff aside and we're focusing on what unites us, not what divides us. At West Florida Baptist Church, our goal, our desire, our aim is to not make a big deal, not even to talk about things that the Bible doesn't necessarily talk about, the things and emphasizing things that may divide us. That's one reason why we do a lot of expository preaching where I start at the beginning of the book of Romans and I work all the way through the end of the book of Romans because you know what? All I want to do is preach God's word. I want to make a big deal about the things God makes a big deal about. And I don't want to make a big deal about things that he doesn't want to make a big deal about. And you can't go wrong if you're just preaching verse by verse through God's word and you're letting God's word speak and say what it needs to say in the hearts and lives of people. And that's our goal and that's our desire. I like what St. Augustine said. He said this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That should be what guides our church. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. And why? Because God accepts all. Look at verses two and three. We welcome all believers because God does. God accepts all. Verse 2, he says, For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs or vegetables or salad. And I just have to say, and they wonder why they're weak, but I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> that's not, that's just my personal interpretation. Sorry. Heart matters. Okay, no, just kidding. <laughs> then look at verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. What is the last few words of this verse? Everybody out loud. For God hath received him. We welcome all believers because God welcomes all believers. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pass judgment. As a church, if you want to be a member of our church, do you know what, what you have to do? You have to give us a clear salvation testimony. You have to be able to, to look back to a time in your life where you recognize that you were a sinner. And you realize what the Bible teaches, that the penalty for sin is death. Man, that's eternal separation from God forever in a very real, literal place called hell. So because we're sinners, we're born into this world sinners, and the punishment for our sin is death, eternal separation from God forever. But the good news is that Jesus loved us enough that he went to a cross to do what? To die for our sins. That was the punishment for my sins. And on the cross, he took my place, and he paid my penalty. And that's why, man, when we sing about the amazing grace of God, and my chains are gone, I've been set free. That's exactly what happened at the cross. He died to pay for your sins. And all we have to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus and we can be saved. So if you want to be a member of our church, if you want to be a member of God's family, even more importantly than that, who God receives, guess what you have to do? 
You have to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus. You have to be able to look at a time in your life where you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And if you do that, God receives you. There is therefore now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't see your flaws and your imperfections. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and you are adopted, and you are a child of the King, and you are a joint heir with Jesus. Praise be to God for what he did for us on the cross. And if God accepts all, who in the world are we not to? So we welcome all believers because God welcomes all Believers, and then last but not least, and we'll be done, the last point, don't despise or judge. Don't despise or judge. All right, so welcome all believers. Don't despise or judge. Look back at verse three. I want you to see the context one more time. It says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. You know what he's saying here? The strong. The strong believers, those of you that are strong in the liberty that you have in Jesus Christ, should not look down on weak believers, weak Christians, with disdain or contempt. How dare you have a position that's not necessarily in God's word? We shouldn't look down with a critical air and a critical nature. And guess what the weak should not do? They should not look at the strong and see them as being spiritually careless, as if they're living on the edge. I mean, how many of you ever heard this before? Like, I can't specifically say that anything in your life is wrong, but I'll tell you what, if you slip up one time, man, you were going over that cliff and you were going down in a heap. I mean, any of you ever heard of that type of thinking before? That, that's what we're talking about here. He's saying to the, the strong, we should not despise or look down with disdain on people that have different positions than, than you or I may have. And the weak should not look at the strong to see them as spiritually careless. And by the way, I, I would wager to bet that most people in here are a little bit weak and a little bit strong. There's areas that we probably have some weak positions that aren't necessarily fully based on the truth of God's word, but for us in our personal lives, it's just a better way to go. And there's other areas that we may be strong, okay? So the point is, it's our hard attitude. There should not be judging or despising that's going on. And he tells us exactly why in verse four. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. In other words, what's God telling us? To mind your own business. <laughs> that's what He's saying it in a very nice way, but that's essentially it. Mind your own business. Don't you love it when somebody else butts into your, into your life? Don't you love it when that coworker comes up and tells you how to do your job better than you're doing it? Isn't that fun? Don't you love it when that person comes along who means well and they tell you how to parent your children? And how you could do it better than what you're doing? No, don't you love those little, uh, those little hints of encouragement that also are like kind of backhanded a little bit? You know what? We all enjoy that, right? No, we don't. <laughs> and the point is this: Listen, it's not my job to judge you about your relationship and your standing with Christ in these areas. Ultimately, it's His job. You're going to stand before Christ one day. And he's saying here, in these areas that aren't necessarily black and white, again, I want, to, I want to emphasize, if somebody's clearly living in sin, yes, we are told to judge that, and you separate from those things. You have to make some decisions. But if it's an area that's not black and white, that's between them and God. That's God's business. You're not my servant. You're God's servant. It's, it's his job. You have a personal relationship with him. You have a walk with God. And so here's... If we're not going to despise and judge, I love the way verse 4 ends, and this is what we need to be. We need to be humble because God holds me up. Look how he ends that verse. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. No matter how right or how wrong you think another believer may be, when they stand before God because they are a believer, he will hold them up. And not only will he hold them up, they will stand. And they will stand not condemned. They will stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they will be accepted and welcomed into the family of God for all of eternity because of what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. And you know what? God will hold me up. That's the whole point. 
I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not waltzing into heaven like this, like standing up straight and tall. Man, I finally made it, God, and I did an awesome job living my life down on earth. That's not how I'm getting there. I'll tell you what, I need just as much of God's grace and mercy as anybody else in here. You know what I'm aware of? I'm aware of the fact that I am far from a perfect husband, and I'm far from a perfect father, and I'm far from a perfect friend, and I'm far from a perfect pastor. And these are areas in my life that more than anything, I I want to be righteous, and I want to please God. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to fail. I don't want to mess up. I want the unity of the Spirit in my home and in my life. I want Christ to be clearly seen. But guess what? If you look close, you'll find faults. You're going to find problems. Because I'm messed up and imperfect just like everybody else here. And I'm fighting every single day of my life to be right and to be pleasing before God. And I know that's true of all of you here. So why do we judge? Why are we so quick to pounce on each other when they're down? When that's the exact opposite of what God tells us to do as the body of Christ. He's going to hold us up. We all are just as guilty, but we are all just as saved by grace and his mercy. And I need grace upon grace upon grace. And you need grace upon grace upon grace. And that's what we should be extending to one another. So just be humble. Just be humble. And then grow in faith and gratitude. Look at verses 5 and 6. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, what's he do? Everybody help me out. He that regardeth the day, he does what? He regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, what does he do? To the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. What's he do? For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. And what does he do? And he giveth God thanks. Do you know what's true about weak and strong believers? They are both people who are full of faith. We're not talking about legalists here necessarily when we're talking about the weak believers. We're just talking about somebody who genuinely believes that it's not holy to eat that meat because it's been offered to idols and maybe they need to grow and maybe they need to see the truth of God's word, but they're acting and living out of a heart of faith towards God. They don't say that if I eat this meat, I'm going to perish and I'm lost. No, they know they're saved. They know they're secure. And the strong aren't frivolously living, trying to live their best life, throwing away the rules and the standards. That's not it either. They're living their life to the glory of God and thanking God that it's not about a list of do's and don'ts because I'm going to fail over and over again, but I'm free in Christ and I'm going to live my life every single day to his honor and to his glory. Both the weak and strong are full of faith. And guess what? They're also full of gratitude. They both are radically God-centered and deeply grateful people. Hey, the weak, they don't even care that they're not eating meat. They're just glad that they're saved. And they'll eat salad and vegetables every day for the rest of their life if it brings God glory. Because you know what? They don't care. They're glad that they're saved. And the strong... Hey, they're radically God-centered. They're thanking God that they've been saved out of the oppressive law that all it did was remind them over and over again that they're guilty and that there was no way that their sins could ever be forgiven and they're glad and they're thankful that they're not bound to that anymore and they get up and they live every day in the freedom that Christ has set us free and they do it with a heart of gratitude and thankfulness to God. And you know what we need to do? We need to grow in faith And gratitude. The point isn't to stay weak, by the way. Paul makes it very clear where the Bible stands and where he stands. And he stands on the side of the strong. And I've already told you, I've been thinking through all this. I got areas in my life I know I'm weak. I got areas in my life I probably am strong. Okay, so the, the point, though, isn't to stay weak. The point is to grow in our faith. The point is to grow in our gratitude. The point is to get up every day and to hunger and thirst for righteousness and peace and letting the glory of God be seen and lifting high the name of Jesus and living on mission and recognizing that there's a world that is in desperate need of Jesus. By the way, we have people in our world, and I'm not being unkind, but we got people in this world that think it's okay for children to go from being a boy to being a girl. 
And we sit in church and we argue about frivolous things that don't even matter while the world is going to hell. And you know what Satan's doing? He's laughing. He is laughing because he's got us so sidetracked from what's important and what really matters. And the whole point is this. If we are growing in faith and we're growing in gratitude and we're passionately seeking Jesus and we're passionately seeking the good of our brothers, I promise you the frivolous things will start looking a whole lot more frivolous. And the important things will start looking a whole lot more important. And that's the heart of how we need to approach everything that happens inside the church. Don't be so quick to despise. Don't be so quick to judge. Let's look for what unites and not what divides. Because God wants to do great things for his honor and for his glory through our lives and our testimonies.